I want to begin this by really recognizing the most important folks here. And of course, I'd be left out if I didn't thank my wife, who has been unrelenting in her uh, support of this. And many people calling in the middle of the night or during hot hours when I was working always got her uh, voice on the phone. And I heard many, many times how helpful she was. And my daughter, who was there from the time she was born and shared many, many, many hours uh, of me doing this, which should have been spent with her. So, um, but she's carried on the tradition in, in helping, uh, in this case, with autistic children. So she, uh, she has made a career for herself and my son-in-law who walked into all this craziness. But in reality, the group that I need to thank is all of you. And I want, honestly, a round of applause, if not for yourself, for the person sitting next to you who has done so much you guys are angels to help these dogs that come from such incredible, just incredible backgrounds. There's some amazing stories here, and I am honored. It is a privilege to be a, a member of this group, and I applaud all of you. Um, the, in order to, to know where it is we are, it, it is critical to understand where we've been. And um, I think the best place to start is at the beginning. And 35 years ago, in two weeks, um, my lovely bride said, I do. And after she did, uh, we immediately left all our friends and family and traveled from Michigan down to Georgia, where we knew nobody and knew nothing. And this was the day before computers and before internet and before CNN. We knew nothing of the South. We'd never been there. This was a total adventure and leaving behind everything we knew. And uh, being that I was at Emory's medical school with going through some very, very long hours and shifts and rotations, she wanted a dog. And so we actually ended up with a foundling little schnauzer poodle, mean little thing, but you'll see a, a, uh, you'll see a video of her here momentarily. But very, very shortly thereafter, within a few weeks, she was walking through the mall and saw a amazing looking dog in the pet store and said, what is that thing? I've got to have that thing. And we knew nothing of Basenjis. We'd never heard of a Basenji. We immediately went ahead and went to the book they had and started, and I said, what are we gonna do with like an African hunting wild dog in our house? But she insisted, and so a few days later, I returned the very nice sewing table I had bought her for her birthday, or for her first anniversary, and uh, went with my money in hand to the pet shop and offered them everything I had, which was literally half of what they wanted. Uh, being a poor grad student, we didn't have two nickels to rub together. And uh, finally, because the dog had been there for three months, because nobody else knew what the Senji was, um, they sold her to me. And that was Senji. And had it not been for her, uh, I wouldn't be up here today. Um, the truth of the matter is, five years later, we took her into the doctor because she was uh, urinating and drinking a lot. And they said, well, she probably has diabetes. Let's test her. Oh, no, her sugar is normal. She's got this thing called Fanconi, um, and she's going to die shortly, and there's nothing you can do. Um, that was pretty shocking information. But because I had the entire resources of Emory University Medical Center at my disposal, I had all the resources of the Centers for Disease Control, which was down the street at my disposal. And I had the ear, because of my place at Emory, I had the ear of as many human uh, specialists as I could get a hold of and probably could get a hold of a number of veterinary specialists. Uh, my immediate opinion was, no, she's not going to die not on my watch, not without a fight. And uh, over the next three years, uh, that fight went on and we measured blood. She was getting blood work weekly, sometimes several times a week. We were doing all sorts of chemistry tests. We did something called laser flash photospectrometry on her urine, where we took her urine and we analyzed every single component that was being lost. Today, that kind of equipment is in a suitcase. Back when I did it, it took a room full of equipment. There were only two centers in the entire world that had the equipment to do it, and yet my dogs here and managed to get into that test uh, sequence. Um, I pushed a lot of doors open. 
But um, what you're about to see I thought was worth looking at. You're going to have to excuse the incredible, horrible home video quality shot on a big old fashioned VHS camcorder. But what I did is we had almost all of the protocol done. We had all the blood chemistries we could figure out to correct, corrected, and she was still going downhill rapidly. So I made a videotape of her uh, because I realized just me sending a letter to specialists around the world was not necessarily going to get their attention. Sending a videotape of her might, and indeed it did, and I got multiple responses from multiple specialists, including um, Jean Barsanti, who was chief of urology at University of Georgia, which was uh, just a couple hours away. And indeed, she consented to see Senji immediately, and um, the last pieces of the puzzle fell into place about how to treat Fanconi purely by accident, um, which is a story I can give you at a later point, but basically she had a 12-hour test done. Um, she was, had been weak and limping. You will see pictures of her almost at her worst. Uh, she actually deteriorated further from what you're going to see here. Um, but once we got her up there, they did a 12-hour test and they did muscle biopsies and she was a in a sling getting IV fluids for 12 hours overnight. And meanwhile, Hurricane Hugo was pointing to Savannah, Georgia, where we lived. And we hadn't been home in five days because we were up there with her at the university. And they said, look, she's going to be feel like heck, she's going to look terrible, she's going to be weak and, and awful, more than she was coming in here, which was just days away from dying. Um, but we realized you got to get home and get ready for this hurricane, so we'll, we know you know how to recover her, we'll, we'll just let you go with her. So they take her out of the sling, put her out on the front lawn on a Sunday morning of UGA Medical Center, and all the students and whatever coming by on a bright Sunday morning must have been amazed because there was the head of neurology, the head of urology, the several of the graduate students, my wife and I sitting there, jaws agape, watching this dog that 12 hours before had been dying, running around on the lawn of the UGA Medical Center as if nothing was wrong with her. And we all sat there and looked at each other and said, what did we do? And it took a while, but we figured out there were certain amino acids and uh, phosphorus specifically that were in that drip just as a carrier. And that's what was going on. And that was the last piece of the Fanconi puzzle. So this is actually a little tape. Once I had the early tape that I had sent, I paired it with a little tape done in 1990 to show how the Fanconi protocol had improved her. So bear with me for 15 minutes of home video to do the before and after, and then we'll get on with more education. Senji 
when she was uh, very, very sick and deteriorating over the course of several days. And then we will have a little bit of the uh, after shot showing how well she's doing now. But first we will go to uh, some footage that was taken uh, in mid-88 when she began deteriorating. Uh, she went, started showing some limpness in one leg and this progressed within the course of about 72 hours to a generalized uh, weakness through the whole body and uh, after about four or five days she was actually to the point where she was bedridden in constant pain, unable to move, urinating right where she lay, and we were very much in fear for her life. And uh, let's go to those frames now, uh, and then we will show you the after. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, all right. It's okay. Come on. so she could get into that. I know I didn't torture her like this all the time. I did carry her up the stairs, but I wanted to get this on video. Good girl. Do you see her? Where's the cat? Come on. Come later where she's getting worse and worse. I mean, it literally was good random girl, material. Good girl, good girl. Come upstairs, darling. Come on, good girl. Good girl, come on, go upstairs. Good girl. Good girl, come on, good girl. Good girl, come on, go upstairs. That's my girl. Yeah. That's a, please help me look. I don't feel very good. To give you something that's feeling right now, she just peed on the bed over here. Uh, she was, um, obviously the sheets were down, but she urinated on the bed without even getting up. She just couldn't, she tried to get up and she couldn't move her back legs. Only after she was lying in the wet did she attempt to, uh, attempt to stand up and move over. Come on, girl. Stand up. Come on, baby. Can you stand up? Come on. Good girl. Come on. Okay. Wanna get a drink of water? Wanna get a drink? Come on, good girl. Good girl, go on. 
Can you get that one? Get that. Oh, thank you. Anyone that's got the same home will understand this. As you can see, she is having an accident right on the carpet in front of us. Our house was covered in the slab sponges, or in the, the chunks. Something else that many people will, will recognize. So, give you an idea of how much she drinks. trying to really make a point on these doctors so when they saw it they'd have some sense of this is something I need to try and do something about. It's pretty amazing my little dog will put away that much water. Of course what goes in must come out. grass grow, but in reality, when you're dealing with a medical problem, this is... You should right. drink a bowl like this. About every two hours or so. My human patients are really able to explain how incredibly dry you feel. You're sitting there drinking and you don't feel like you're drinking. That's uncontrolled thinking. It was actually a somewhat short drink. I usually just choose us to rest seated on the floor since her favorite uh, viewing spot, which was the uh, hassock, which we put specifically by the window for her, uh, has now become at about a foot and a half high, literally out of reach. Uh, for her to get up on unless one of us lifts her up. However, when we lift her up on it, she usually screams because it hurts her. So that's where she sits. Sandy. Come on, girl. Good girl. That's right. How could I get another one? And now we'll take a look at some footage of how Sanji is doing today and over the course of the year and a half, almost two years now that she's been on her replacement therapy uh, with a gradual improvement over about three months and then leading up to now where she is basically in as good a state of health as she's ever been. That was her. <laughs>
he was so it became hard to believe that's the same dog that you saw earlier, a couple years later. I mean, and yes, that is still in Savannah, Georgia, by the way. <laughs> The one time in 20 years. She is doing wonderful at this point. Um, we, of course, realize that she still has the Zancomi yeah, syndrome. And thus, we measure her blood work every couple of months. And that's kind of monitoring her progress that way, as well as uh, giving her replacement therapy daily, several times a day, with the appropriate uh, tablets to make up for the various losses she has. But uh, at this point, uh, as I can tell many people, I don't think there's any reason that a Mesenji with Anconi syndrome can't live to its full life expectancy uh, with this disorder if it is well managed and well controlled uh, using some very simple and basic good sound medical management techniques. Uh, as I said, she's living proof and so are some other dogs out there. So we are enjoying every single day with her and we're glad she's doing this well. All right. Best of luck to you all. Say bye, Andy. <laughs> now, I made the statement back in 1990 that they could live a normal life expectancy. That was, I didn't even remember having said that. That was pretty bold, especially <laughs> since it would be 10 years before scientific research papers actually proved that that was correct. But just based on how well she had done, I had a hunch that's what was happening. So. What have the decades taught us about fighting this disorder and identifying this disorder? Well, today at this meeting is, comes the introduction of uh, the 2015 uh, Fanconi Protocol, which is new, improved, seriously uh, uh, simpler to follow for veterinarians and human physicians around the world. And uh, the fact of the matter is that this meeting, thank you all, the last five, six years I've been promising to do a new protocol and it was the invitation of this meeting that finally lit that match under my rear end and say, just do it. And so it will be introduced for you and we have copies for all of you to take to your uh, veterinarians and uh, have it on file and it will be online so that it will be available for everyone. It's been. Uh, translated into many, uh, into many different languages, and I already have requests from the Basenji uh, uh, Club of Japan and Germany to have this lecture sent to them ASAP for their, uh, so they can show it translated at their meetings. So, uh, thank you all. <laughs> all righty, so meat and potatoes. I'm sure other people with other diseases hear this, but fact is, we hear this all the time, how can they be sick? They look so healthy. We got to remember, Fanconi is still around and it is, if left untreated, it's just as lethal as it ever was. Um, part of the failure for people to take it seriously is a measure of our success. Good testing, good treatment um, means it's not in your face as much as it was a few years ago. And um, if you all have been in this breed for a while, which I know many of you have, you'll remember this from the Basenji magazine. Every month they would do some kind of a public service announcement. Five minutes, once a month for life to go ahead and do your urine strip testing. Now, I wasn't sure where to talk about this, and this actually was not part of this conference initially. But it has come to my attention in the last couple days that there are a number of people still adopting out Basenjis, especially rescue Basenjis as opposed to breeders, that are telling people to do urine strip testing. And let me tell you why that's probably not the right thing to do anymore. <laughs> um, the fact of the matter is we never saw glucose being lost in Fanconi dogs until they turned about three years old. So the recommendation used to be from the time they're three, test, test their... Uh, uh, urine and we'd see glucose. If we saw glucose loss, we knew they were probably losing bicarb at that point. And the bicarb loss is what, what kills. The thing is, with the advent of the genetic test, we had some people, including one who was a physician, thankfully, who had a six-month-old Basenji, came back with a positive test from the Missouri Genetic uh, Lab and the orthopedic Associated or Orthopedic Foundation for Animals is what it's called, even though it does all sorts of things other than orthopedics. But 
they went ahead and got a positive result, and he said, well, I, I want to get a baseline blood gas on my dog. And I said, no, that's a waste of time. The dog's not losing bicarb at this point. You know, why poke the dog for nothing? He said, well, you know, I, I've got a blood gas analyzer in my clinic. I can do it for nothing. I, I just would feel better doing it. And I'm glad he insisted, and I'm glad I was wrong, because uh, it turned out the dog was already losing bicarb at six months of age. So we quickly learned that the urine strip testing we've been relying on is actually a very late indicator for the loss of bicarb. You're already years into the disease before that will catch any of So my recommendation in the absolute strongest possible terms is to go ahead, do the genetic test. Now, I will tell you this, the genetic test, thanks to a later Basenji that we have right now, who's 12 years old and is a Fanconi girl, she tested negative on the gene marker test. And it's one of the reasons we got it. We were real careful. I didn't want to deal with another Fanconi dog at home. Ha ha. God had other plans. Um, so we went ahead, we got this dog, took her in for a UTI test uh, because she was peeing a little bit. And Fanconi never crossed my mind, amazingly. And uh, the vet came out and said, uh, you're not going to believe this, Steve. She's got Fanconi. And my wife and I looked at each other and we said, oh, is that all? <laughs> what a difference three decades makes. But that was honestly, it was like, okay, Fanconi we can deal with. No big deal. Um, but the reality is the genetic test, her blood helped take it from a gene marker test. It showed her and some other dogs that also had false positives or false negatives allowed them to fine tune the test. So now we have a genetic test, not a gene marker test. So we have a much more accurate test now. So that's what you want to do. You want anybody that gets one of these dogs, or if you own a dog, get the gene test. If that test is negative, then you don't have to really worry. There's always some, some error rate. So in the event you see some symptoms, go ahead and then you can do your urine strip test and test for glucose in the urine. If you get a positive test, that's what I tell people, if your genes, you know the dog's going to develop at some point, that's the point at which to do a yearly um, blood gas, check for bicarb levels, and in the meantime, every month, check your urine glucose. So that's where the strict testing does come in handy. Um, survival time and lifespan. This is the paper we were talking about, which I'm sure many of you have seen, and it's referenced in the new protocol. But it basically was done in 2004 by uh, Dr. Yearly at UGA's vet school, and it did indeed show that dogs with Fanconi treatment, whoa, could live a full uh, normal life expectancy with a high quality of life. The, uh, they went through the diagnosis, but the bottom line is uh, dogs treated under the Gonto protocol were roughly equivalent to those seen in middle-aged dogs uh, post -agon. It's The bottom line is the death rate was no higher in the Fanconi dogs that were treated than in, in the untreated in populations that didn't have Fanconi. So in other words, you can have Fanconi, but you can die of something else. It's a, it's a disease you can live with, not die from. And that's pretty important for a previously 100% fatal disease. Um, I call this the changing face of Fanconi. I thought it was funny because the animal behaviorist had this exact same slide in her presentation <laughs> yesterday. You all recognize it. But uh, this used to be what we thought of as Fanconi, since that's all we knew about. Um, and it was a genetic disease, all about genetics. If they were born with the wrong gene set, there you had it. You made it two carriers, you had it. And then it got a little more complicated because, first of all, there's actually three breeds with a very high incidence of genetic fan county. You've got our Basenjis, of course, and then you have Norwegian Alcons. But Norwegian Alcons, it onsets at a different age. It onsets at about seven. Norwegian Alcons tend to live to about 10, 11 years old. They're a short-lived dog. So people in the breed uh, would go, well, yeah, this one died a little earlier, this one died a little later, yeah, no big deal. And they put their head in the sand and really didn't want to identify with it. Thankfully, that has changed, and there are a number of Norwegian Alcon breeders that are much more in tune with testing and whatever. And there's, there is some talk about the genetic test being extended uh, for, specifically for um, Norwegians as well. And then this is sort of a sad story. You talk about rescue groups like yourself. There's the Cocker Spaniel Rescue Group that rescued these fancy silver cockers, or they're called American Fancy Silver. And they actually all 
started out at a puppy mill down in Florida that had hundreds of these dogs. I know there was also a puppy mill in Florida that did Basenjis at some point. It's terrible, these puppy mills. But they were breeding, inbreeding a tremendous amount of Fanconi, and so I now get calls at least once a month on one of these fancy silver cockers that uh, is suffering from Fanconi as well. So, say out the story, but that's the genetic uh, component. But this is what changed everything. Um, I sincerely, I, I, I don't want the Chinese government, which owns all their industries despite the supposed fairness involved, to come after me. So I'm not going to say anything about treats made in China. I'm not going to identify China as being in any way involved or that I personally don't feed anything from China. I will not give my dogs any treats from China. I won't say that. I don't in any way want to discuss China. However, I will let the Food and Drug Administration of the United States of America address it. Since uh, back in 2012, the beginning to end of 2012, there were over 1,000 complaints. Uh, they had 383 deaths. Uh, it's well over 2,000 at this point. Um, they put out these warnings, and then they did a recall a year later. Um, here, this again, this is the federal government. So the Chinese, if they have opposition to this, can go after our federal government, which I think they are, if you read the latest PACs going on. But uh, death count was 600 and counting. Again, this is from the federal government. They recalled it, but sure enough, within a couple months, pressure, political pressure, business pressure, I can't explain it they were back on the market. Um, and so what started as a trickle of Fanconi uh, in dogs that had ingested these kind of treats uh, quickly became a flood. And every breed you can name came knocking at my door, um, literally and figuratively. Um, and I will tell you this right now, uh, small dogs fared much worse. There's, a, there's two components to the Chinese jerky treat ingestion thing. Number one, we don't really know what the chemicals are inside. They found melamine, which is a plastic hardener. They found high doses of antibiotics, which don't belong there to begin with. There's, there's all kinds of speculation about what's going on. But the cause effect thing is almost unquestioned at this point. The thing is, the dose, if they get a very high dose, have eaten a lot of it, or if the treat itself has a high dose, they do poorly. And the other thing is, if they're a small dog, they do poorly. Most of the deaths have been in small dogs. Bigger dogs can take a bigger hit. Um, but you still don't want to go there, because it ain't pretty, and it does. It is life-threatening. Um, and the truth of the matter is, this was never really a Vicenji problem to begin with. Obviously, our dogs got this disease because the gene is there. Uh, the gene wasn't invented or created in the United States. Um, the gene is found in all mammals, um, and it's just very rare. And as it happens, we, uh, I've gotten calls on every kind of animal you can talk about, including humans, which we'll talk about in a minute, and in birds. And I don't know how you know if a bird is peeing and drinking a lot, but in fact, um, I had a call from the Director of Veterinary Medicine for the Canadian Poultry Board who was concerned about Fanconi in poultry there, and they did some blood work, and sure enough, they got Fanconi chickens. Um, I don't know what they do about it. They're industrial birds, and so they just put down the sick birds. Um, I haven't gotten calls on anybody's, you know, hideously expensive African gray or whatever, but that's just a matter of time. I'm sure that's coming at some point. Um, but the thing is, the genes are there. Why do we have such a prevalent prevalence of it in our breed, it's very simple to explain. If we were flying in a Learjet over a, over a lovely island and, and the Learjet had 12 passengers, just like those 12 original descendants, if you had 12 passengers aboard and you crashed, you had about half and half, male and female, crash on this desert island, plenty to eat, mangoes and, and coconuts and lovely lush gardens, lots of wood to make houses out of, but you're 12 of you are stuck on this island, and you're out in the middle of the Pacific, and no one's going to find you. So you are the only people you have to make other people with. So for the next 20 generations, 
there you are on this island and you're all reproducing with each other. Well, if one of those people, just one, had diabetes, and if one had a diabetic gene but was not expressed as diabetic, just a carrier, just from that interbreeding, you'd probably have about a one in 14 incidence of diabetes among the population of that lovely island. And yet, in the general population, it's like one in 400, one in 600, depending upon the type of diabetes you're talking about. So the reality of it is that you magnify things by interbreeding. Now, the African project, bringing in fresh blood. I love it, it's a great concept, and I support it, but, but. Um, cruise ship finally finds this island, finds the descendants of the original 12. And they say, we're here to rescue you. We found you here. And they go, no, we got this beautiful island here. We got all the coconuts and mangoes and papayas we can eat. Uh-uh, we're staying. And the cruise ship folks, a couple of them go, you know what? That's a beautiful island. I'm going to move on to this island. So they come in and bring some fresh blood. So 10, 12 people move on to that island of now 4,000, 5,000 people. You think that's changing the incidence of diabetes at all among that population? not even making a dent. Now if the people that came off the boat just intermarry with the people that came off the boat, then you still have a lower incidence of diabetes. But remember, diabetes didn't invent itself. It was still there at 1 in 600, 1 in 400 population. So it's still going to be there. So in other words, the way to get rid of this is really through selective breeding, through saying we're not going to breed if we've got the, the gene, and through testing and treatment so you know who does have the carrier. That's not something we do with people, it is something we do with the pups. So, all right, and back to the caution from the FDA, um, which again, these are the stickers on all these wonderful treats. And uh, finally, as of this January, they did a what's called a permanent ban or recall on these kind of treats, but we have a very mixed response from the business community, and I will let you draw your own conclusions. But as of January, Petco, PetSmart, uh, Pet Supermarket, a number of uh, pet chains uh, have pulled them permanently from there. They will no longer sell treats that prompt these compliance. Um, this company says they refuse to pull them off the shelves. And they continue to sell these Chinese treats today, which means I continue to get phone calls about new Fanconi cases and dogs continue to die. So um, this is sort of interesting too, and it, it helps because it allows me to get more attention to the problem and allows me to get more uh, support for doing the necessary research work because while this little face does indeed have Fanconi, this little face can as well. Now, in all due respect, these two, these two little cute faces do not have Fanconi. These were just pulled offline. Um, <laughs> but you still have people that go, well, some vets go, well, Dr. Ganto is not a veterinarian, so I, I don't know about that. Thankfully, because my work is now in the veterinary literature, including the AKC's own health resource site, uh, it is now, I'm getting far, far less of that. And mind you, you don't, all these links are on the new protocol. And when you're online, you can just click on them and go to the, the papers and the appropriate uh, linkage so you don't need to write any of this stuff down. It's all there for you. Yes. Um, this is a, a, a probably a little more familiar face. And I, I, I apologize, I don't know who these are. And again, these are not, these are not actual Fanconi child or dog, but this was an incredibly cute picture I found online. So it's a card. Um, but let's talk about David because this is a Fanconi kid, and it's with his permission that I share this today. And as it happens, the first Fanconi uh, information was shared by me in the Basenji magazine and a few other places um, with just some doctors, nurses, and veterinarians that happen to own Fanconi dogs, because once I saw it was working in my dog, I wasn't sure it would work on every dog, and I didn't want to go touting this thing till I knew it was valid. So I went ahead and shared it with a select group of people I knew would do routine follow-ups, and I knew would do blood work, and I knew would give me accurate results. And they did, and it did work, and so the first protocol was published back in 1990. 
and David happened to have been born one year later, 1991. Unfortunately, you saw Senji with her weakness and her muscle myalgias, neuralgias, um, and David too, even though he was put on the protocol, and mind you, uh, Fanconi, genetic Fanconi is 100% um, lethal in humans by age two, if untreated, or at least used to be. Um, but David was immediately treated appropriately for his Fanconi as we knew how to treat it. Unfortunately, he developed rickets because we, again, still didn't know about all the trace minerals and elements we had to use. However, we learned quickly, as you saw from the video, by 1990, we knew what we were doing. By a year later, January of 2004, there's a nice straight-legged David. Um, and here is David now, today, uh, 24 years old. And this year, this that picture was taken actually just a few weeks ago. And uh, see David, see David run. There's David running through a riot in South Africa. And all David has in his hands is his camera. Because it turns out that David, rather than being a statistic of a previously fatal disease, um, is a blessedly talented photojournalist for UP. And he covers wars and riots in South Africa. And there is David receiving it. This is the equivalent of their national newspaper like our USA Today, that's in South Africa. And there he is receiving a journalism award for his uh, photojournalism. Um, there is one of his pictures, as we say, above the fold, front page above the fold on their national newspaper. Um, very proud accomplishment. Um, these are some of his photojournalist uh, works taken uh, both when the President of the United States was visiting South Africa and there was some national gala event and that's during a riot, obviously. And then here are some of his uh, beautiful artwork. And here are some of his fun photos, as he calls them. And he actually gets ridiculously close to some wildlife. There's, he's got a whole portfolio online and I had a heck of a time picking what pictures to use. But just so you know, uh, the Fanconi Protocol Senji, that little black and white with Senji, um, did more than just help. Uh, did more than just help with Senjis and or dogs or cats or anything else. Um, we've got dozens of cats. We've got racehorses. We've got all kinds of critters on the protocol. Um, I, this picture is in here, and it's not one David took. And this animal does not have Fanconi, and I have no idea, but I found it while I was searching. <laughs> the wildlife pictures, I just thought it was ridiculously cute. So here it is. Um, like everybody it. enjoys a baby of mine. But this is a Fanconi picture because guess what? I got a call several years ago from somebody at Brad an article in their newspaper about a local hippo in the zoo that was sick and they couldn't figure out what was going on and what was going on was Fanconi. And uh, I actually assisted in the care of that animal. Um, sadly, it was already in renal failure, really sick, and it's very, very tough to do routine sampling on a hippo, and it's, it's a logistical issue. But it was indeed Fanconi. So you want to talk about, yeah, I know it's sad. You, you want to talk, I, I, I felt really terrible. I wish they realized what was yeah. going on sooner. But, um, so we need to talk about acquired versus genetic Fanconi. And um, basically, the uh, genetic uh, varieties, which you see uh, in uh, Basenjis, and if it's not treated, appropriately, it is progressive, it will degenerate, the dog will die, uh, usually within about a year of uh, diagnosis. Um, treatment is, is for life. Acquired is, uh, or induced Fanconi, severity based on, on exposure, and the beauty of that one, the kind that comes from the chicken jerky treats, if the dogs are gotten over the hump, um, it is 60% reversible, 20% of the dogs come off within a year, they come off most of the protocol, and only about 20% seem to be, at this point, we're only about five years into dealing with that disaster, but those dogs, about 20% still need to be on the protocol. Now, why is this important, this acquired Fanconi? Because, yes, your dogs can get it too. Just because you've got a Basenji doesn't mean you can't poison its kidneys with outdated tetracycline, organophosphate lung chemicals, exposure to high levels of zinc, like eating the old very kennel screws, 
that used to hold the very kennels together. They used to be a dull silver. Those were zinc. Swallow one of those bad boys, and next thing you know, you got a Fanconi dog. Uh, now they're plastic, thank you. Um, but so this this affects our breed as much as it does any other dog. And I have had a Fanconi dog that was under successful treatment for its genetic Fanconi that all of a sudden started going downhill terribly. And I said, let's get lab work, let's figure out what's going on. And it went on and on, we couldn't figure out. And it occurred to me, this was about two years ago, I said, oh, are you using any kind of treats from China? Oh, nothing, I just use all natural breast, chicken breast. All natural chicken breast from where? Well, we get it at our local pet store just as a bulk package thing. Find out where it's from, sure enough, China. So they were giving Fanconi to the Fanconi dog. We already had control for Fanconi. So they stopped that. Thankfully, the dog turned around, although he did suffer some, some permanent kidney damage from it. So this is serious stuff. Um, finally, they, uh, there was an article that uh, just appeared here recently in one of the quarter horse journals just this year about the transient Fanconi and quarter horses. I didn't have the heart to tell them that I'd had my first Fanconi horse about six years ago, but uh, this is new to them, it's not new to me. And then here, again, the journal this year was making a big deal about a four-year-old Shih Tzu with jerky treats. So the, the, the veterinary journals are about a decade behind what we're doing and catching up, but that's okay, at least they're catching up and once it's in their journals, they know, oh, they research what to do about Fanconi, it comes back to me so that the dogs get treated and that's all I care about. I just don't want anybody to die needlessly at this thing. So, here's a question for all of you. How many of you think the kidney is a filter? Mm -hmm. yes. Oh, come on, I know everybody <laughs> used to say that. What does the kidney do? It filters the blood. Okay. Yeah, wonderful little filter. No, it's anything but a filter. In fact, the kidney is an incredibly complicated machine. And the way that machine works is there are nephrons. This is a kidney. Blood goes in, blood comes out, and there are thousands of these little nephrons collecting tubules, which I'll show you in a minute. And what happens is there's thousands of these inside that, that kidney. The blood comes in here. This is called the loop of Henley, by the way. The blood comes in here, and basically, when the blood goes out of there, all it's got is serum and a few cells. What happens is you've got all these electrolytes and stuff are pulled out and back into the body, and then whatever is left over that shouldn't be in there comes out as urine. So what it does is the body pulls everything out and then pushes back in what, excuse me, it pushes back in what's needed to make whole fresh blood. In diabetes, you see extra, in diabetes, you see extra sugar being lost here because there's an excess of it in the blood. So the body is actually doing its job in diabetes. It just can't get rid of enough of the sugar. Whereas in Fanconi, you're losing the electrolytes, and this is from an old medical textbook. This is how they put Fanconi in these things. RIP is the sodium and the bicarb and the phosphorus and the glucose, the amino acids were all being lost. Whereas normally, they are pulled back into the calyx of the kidney and then put back into the body. Um, so how do we deal with this magic? Well. Uh, based upon blood work, and this was totally original work and it's the first time anybody had ever done it, um, I figured out the normal pH of the blood in, in arterial blood, and then we realized we weren't treating a pulmonary disorder, so we didn't need arterial blood, so that involved, and poor Senji, she, God bless her, she was the best dog imaginable. We used to flip her on her back and stick her femoral artery for blood, sometimes a couple times a week, because we thought that's how you got arterial blood from a dog. Um, and then we realized well, we really don't need arterial blood, we need venous blood, and nobody had ever given the normal venous blood equivalent, which is now found in all the medical books and all, on all the machines, and that was my original work. I measured arterial blood and then got the venous blood to compare to it. So, and then I created the expected uh, Fanconi references. And the problem was, 
that this is the, uh, let's say, the attitude, uh, the mellow attitude of the dogs. Remember I said this was my dog who was used to being poked and prodded and was a, an amazingly good soul about it. Um, it was also the uh, attitude of the dogs that were owned by the vets that lived at the vet clinic and, and you know, it was no big deal for them to get poked. Uh, actually, just so you'll identify more with Basenjis, these, this was the attitude of the Basenjis that we took care of uh, early on. This was, uh, they were mellow, mellow mode. Um, however, this led to the beautiful treatment uh, protocol, uh, the bicarb dosing scale, which was an amazing piece of work. And you're looking at 30 years of my life right there. And you used to measure the blood gas and you'd get the CO2, and then you'd get the pH, and you'd go ahead and figure out the bicarb dose from in there, and that's on the protocol card, and that's a, that's a, that's a big deal, except for the fact that the mellow dogs were not real dogs in the real world. These were pet dogs in the real world that were in the car and driving to the doctor's office and then in the, in the waiting room where they got all these neat scents and smells and dogs snarling at them. And then they're going into the back and then the doctor's coming at them with a the needle and they're getting poked and there's all the fear pheromones in the room. And so, let, let me give you something that you'll identify with more. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is the attitude of the pet dogs that we were treating. Well, the problem with that is, it means they're blowing off the CO2 and the pH, which is affected by CO2, becomes very, very, um, CO2 is an acid. So when you blow off the acid, your blood becomes more alkaline. And we really don't know for sure what the real blood, uh, chemistry looks like at rest. It becomes very confusing because our CO2 goes down, our pH goes down, the kind of body becomes acidotic. So in other words, to get an idea of the dog at rest, you say, well, was this a little bit of a hyper dog, a lot of a hyper dog? <laughs> and then you're applying, this is, this is actually a formula that if it was in real time, would drop another nine pages down into the floor. It's called the henderson hasselbalch equation. But you'd have to apply that to the blood uh, gas results in order to try and figure out what the dog was really doing um, at rest. And that just became a little cumbersome. Vets couldn't do it. They would come to me and I'd crunch out the numbers and was hoping I was kind of close and then we'd dose based upon that result. But that's why tonight, 30 years of my own research, is going right there. Because as it turns out, all we need to do with our new simple goal, and mind you, vets were jumping up and down that I've already talked to about this, because the other formulas and stuff were driving them bonkers. Mm -hmm. All we do is look at the bicarb, and the bicarb doesn't care if you're excited, if you're calm, if you're sleepy, it doesn't care. The bicarb is the bicarb you got in your body, and after all, that's all we're trying to do, is replace the bicarb that you've lost. Again, you don't need to copy this down, this is all on the protocol, believe me. This is the heart of the protocol, and if we can correct the bicarb, which is normally 24, if we can get it to the 20 to 22 range, everything else, everything else in the blood chemistry stabilizes and you can control the fanconi. And in fact, um, that the beauty of it does not depend on the dog's excitement or calmness, no guessing or math calculations, it reflects the real chemical we're lost that we're trying to replace with fanconi, and you correct that and everything falls into place. Now, why did it take me so long to figure out the simpler way of doing things? Well, for millions of years, men drew stuff, dragged stuff around on the ground, and for most of that time, it was not with horses, which we were still doing a couple hundred years ago, but it was with dogs, poor old dogs. And we've actually found some literally cave dweller versions of these uh, drawing sleds and they were obviously too close together for humans, so they were early proto-dogs. So yeah, so for tens of thousands of years we did things like that, and then it took another few hundred thousand years to come up with that, and then about 50 more thousand years to go from that to that. So, sorry guys, it only took me 30 years to come up with the easy solution, so eh, I don't think I did too bad. Um, when people ask you to explain how the protocol works and how Fanconi works, I've actually used, this is a simplistic example, but it really, really does, I've had veterinarians and human physicians go, oh yeah, that's a great example. Basically, I call it my five gallon, fish in a five gallon bucket model. 
And so you've got the, the bucket is the human body or the dog's body, and the fish is the organ. And you've got a fish living in that wonderful five gallon bucket. Mean Mr. Fanconi pops a one gallon a day hole in the bottom. Well, obviously, at this point, your fish has five days before his bucket is out of water and uh, he passes away. Same with the organs. After a certain amount of time, you've lost down your bicarb, you've become acidotic, you go into multi-system failure, you pass away. However, if nice Mr. Protocol puts a gallon of fresh water in the top, in other words, meets the exact same losses that are happening at the bottom, well, Mr. Fish, or the organs, can live their full life expectancy and never know there was a problem with their bucket. And that's exactly what we do here, is we are, this is a replacement protocol. And the hallmarks that we still need are three critical tests. We need the urinalysis, we see if there's sugar in there. We need the general blood chemistry test to look for the five prime things that we're losing. Sodium, or potassium, calcium, phosphorus, and then we also look at BUN and creatinine. Those are all, you don't need to write them, it's all on the protocol, honestly, <laughs> very clearly. Those five things, and then you need a venous blood gas, because sorry, there is no substitute for a venous blood gas. It's the only thing that gives you an accurate right now picture of what you're dealing with in terms of bicarb values. When they send off blood, blood is a living substrate, it's a living thing, and it continues to metabolize, and so the, the uh, system in there, it becomes more acidotic, it eats up the bicarb, so you don't get an accurate level. It has to be a venous blood gas, and all that involves is drawing the blood out of the dog and immediately putting it in the machine, and within about three minutes, you got a result. The key is only about half the vets in the United States have uh, blood gas analyzers, if that. Um, even if your vet doesn't, if you have a local veterinary emergency clinic, they will and then university vet centers do. In the past, I used to tell people, and thankfully it worked, they could you know, contact a local human hospital and they would usually run them many times for free. That doesn't work anymore because of all the, the coding and the charges and the, you have to enter patient names, it's all computerized. So that doesn't, that really, that venue is not open anymore. So in all reality, you've got to find a veterinary facility to have a blood gas. Now, having said this, I, I'm gonna give a little side story I didn't plan to do, but, um, back in the old days before the internet, before I got email and faxes and, 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 uh, and, and texts and whatever, I had, uh, sorry faxes, old, old school. Um, we used to get phone calls, that's how vets contacted me. And they never thought when they were around the world what time zone it was I was in. So I'd get calls at two in the morning, three in the morning, four in the morning. Of course, I'm not gonna say, no, I can't help you call back, because in the morning I'll be in the operating room. So I'd sit there and talk to them for two hours. They, that's the way it went. But I got a call once from Scotland at about two in the morning. And I had a veterinarian that says, I think I have a Fanconi dog and I'm looking for advice on how, how much bicarb to treat it. And I said, okay, well, I, I don't know what you're doing in Scotland there, but you, you, you've, uh, and, and mind you, this is a decade ago. And I said, I, I'm gonna need a blood gas. And he says, well, yes, I've got that. I said, you, you already have the blood gas? Uh, I said, well, he said, yeah, I ran that first thing. I said, so you have a blood gas analyzer, and this was where one in a hundred vets in the U.S. might have had a blood gas machine. And I said, you, you have a blood gas analyzer, and there's silence at the other end of the phone, and then he goes, well, I, I, I am a veterinarian with a veterinary hospital. I said, okay, well, you realize most vets in the United States don't have blood gas machines. Silence again, and then he goes, well, do they have stethoscopes? Or <laughs> in fact, he took it for granted. That was a standard part in Scotland of, of what a vet clinic went into. The smallest little vet clinic in the littlest town had a blood gas machine. That was basic, basic stuff. And it turns out I discovered the value a nation places on their dogs or on their pets, but usually dogs. And in Scotland, they're very highly prized. They're, they're extreme they would have the technology to meet it. And as much as we like to think in the United States we're on the cutting edge and front end of everything, that's yeah, not always true. You have other countries such as today, I'm helping a physician from California that retired in um, Portugal. They have very low, Portugal, Spain, very low uh, importance on their dogs. And so they still basically have a stethoscope and an old x-ray machine. I talk to them about blood gases and they're like, I'm speaking Chinese. So, um, but so a blood gas is absolutely essential. Um, 
Let me ask you, it has been it has been an hour. Do you want to take a quick break and then I'll continue or do I barrel ahead? Quick break. Hmm? Quick break. Quick break. Take a quick break. You guys are awesome. The board is awesome. If people take your stuff seriously, I cannot tell you how much I admire this. Uh, I'm humbled. Um, back to what we were talking about here. I'm very pleased. That, that means more dogs are going to get in, intercepted before they develop any symptoms at all. And it's so much easier to treat. We've had a couple, as long as, as, as you made that announcement, let me follow it up with this. We've had a couple dogs that were caught in that early six months, eight months, one year old stage now, where they get one by card twice a day, and that's it. And there's now dogs that are five, six years into it, and that's all they get, and that's all they seem to need. So we completely stabilize it at a very, very early age. So that's that's the right thing to do. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, back to this, let's make the medical part easy. The three tests we talked about, urinalysis, general blood chemistry test, and the venous blood gas. Though, you know, somebody was asking me in the break if we could do the venous blood gas, would that alone be sufficient to do the diagnosis? And the answer is yes, it would. That would be the confirmed diagnosis is loss of ICAR. But then you still need a blood chemistry test to know if you've got any renal failure going on, to know what your electrolyte balances are, to know if the dog does or doesn't need potassium, which some of them do. And then the urinalysis, if nothing else, you need to check for, um, uh, to see if they have a UTI, because a lot of these dogs are first diagnosed with UTI because they have a bladder full of sugar. Plus their bladders are, are very alkalotic because of the bicarb they're losing, so they're prone to that. Um, your analysis, positive glucosuria, or that's just a fancy term for uh, glucose sure. in the urine, and the absence of elevated blood glucose. Now, I've still got vets that find this and they go, what must be diabetes insipidus, which is not diabetes, it's actually a hormonal problem. And while it does happen in Basenji's, it's really pretty down and rare. Um, you know, if it walks like a horse and sounds like a horse, it's not a zebra. Um, check for the Fanconi first before going down the primrose path of, of anything else, if you find these findings. But the, the urine sugar, as I said, is no longer the gold standard because we have seen bicarbonate loss, as I explained earlier, at, at younger ages than we used to check for it. So useful, after a positive genetic test, doing the urine test at home, is the, the strip testing is, uh, is useful, but it's not the, the gold standard the genetic test is. General blood chemistry tests, these are the five values I talked about, calcium, potassium, phosphorus, are three electrolyte or three body components that I know are being lost, and we need to often replace them. Most dogs get enough from the general vitamins from the uh, potassium, but some dogs need specific potassium replacement, and we do that based upon the blood, measured blood. Um, the urine and creatinine are measures of uh, kidney failure or kidney insufficiency. Those are waste products of metabolizing protein. And if you see those values going up in any dog or any human, it means the kidneys aren't doing their job completely and the waste products are being retained in the blood. And that is not Fanconi, but it can happen if Fanconi is left uncontrolled. So some dogs need to be treated for their elevated waste products or their renal failure on top of the Fanconi. And there is a specialized component of the protocol for that. Um, and what you want to ask when your vet does a general blood panel, many of them don't do phosphorus. Um, so ask them for a senior profile, which includes liver enzymes and a whole lot more in it. And it's usually the test is about $5, $6 more for the complete profile rather than the reduced profile. Some of the vets just order what they call a SNAP6, which just gives you some, some but not all of the blood components. And the other thing is too, a lot of our Basenjis are on thyroid medicine and they are hypothyroid. Um, Dr. Jean Dodd and I had this discussion, she's the, the Basenji, um, she's the guru of, of Basenji thyroids, but the fact of the matter is she is a breeder and a shower herself. And she talks about the fact that the, the, uh, a lot of our dogs, the values may be mismeasured. They may run a low thyroid to begin with, but in very low thyroid, they need to be corrected. And the fact of the matter is that uh, if the Fanconi is not controlled, 
don't, if you've got a dog coming in to work it up for Fanconi, don't have them draw a T4 level to look for thyroid problems at that point, because it will be artificially low. And then you may be treating a dog who really doesn't need it. When you have uncontrolled Fanconi, you've got acidosis in your body, and that throws all your systems out of whack. Um, matter of fact, let's go back. Okay, I'm gonna do a little side lesson here for all of you. Any of you, show of hands, if you ever do any kind of hard exercise, or have ever done any hard exercise. <laughs> <laughs> okay, were you huffing and puffing? You ever gotten yeah. to the point where you're huffing and puffing? Why were you huffing and puffing? Too much. I did it. Yeah, but why was your body going? <laughs> you're lacking oxygen. Love it. That's a layperson's answer that is completely wrong. <laughs> Your body, there's no way in the world you are running out of oxygen. As a matter of fact, even an Olympic athlete doing their hardest run is not even a knockoff a quarter of the oxygen molecules flowing through their blood. It's why you can do hands-only CPR. You've all heard of that? You don't need to do mouth-to-mouth -mouth anymore because I knew people weren't doing mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. Yeah. So they do hands-only because there's plenty of, plenty of oxygen in the bloodstream. It's the reason you can do mouth-to-mouth because -mouth, you're blowing out enough oxygen to have another person Survive off the oxygen you're blowing up. Let me take a stab at it. Take a stab. So obviously you're blowing off CO2, but there's but also lactic acid. acid as well. You get two points, <laughs> not just one. That's the bottom line. Your body goes <laughs> because your muscles are producing extra CO2. Remember I said CO2 was an acid. You also, when you feel the burn, that's lactic acid. That's acidosis. So you're blowing off not only enough CO2 to make up for that extra CO2 that your body has, but you're blowing off extra CO2 even lower to blow off and neutralize that lactic acid. Why? Why does the body have all these systems to neutralize acid? Because we live in a very narrow band of pH. If our blood deviates up or down from that pH, then it denatures proteins. And our bodies are 100% protein engines, from the neurotransmitters in our brain to our muscles, which operate our heart and our digestive, everything, our protein engines. You deviate from that little bit of pH where we normally live, and you, all your body denatures, all your systems stop, and you die. And dying is a bad thing. So the bottom line is we got a lot of mechanisms in our body to design to help keep us in that narrow range of pH. And that's actually what we're doing with Fanconi, is we're treating and keeping the pH normal in order to new, normalize the entire system. And one other aside, since we do have human Fanconi patients, I've got one young lady that runs marathons and does all that stuff, and she said the lactic acid burn that you feel, Fanconi, if it's uncontrolled, she doesn't take her Vicub, she gets that all over. And it just doesn't go away. You pop a couple bicarb pills and all of a sudden it's instant relief. So the human patients are able to at least tell me what Fanconi feels like. And I'm sure the dogs are feeling the same thing. So the uncontrolled Fanconi in Burton, it feels very uncomfortable. Um, when we put in the bicarb, everything goes back to normal. So we're, we're helping them physically as well. And remember the behaviorist was talking about illness can lead to aggression and bad behavior. Well, when you don't feel good, you don't feel good, and dogs take it out the way they take it out. So even if, you know, combining the illness with, with uh, uh, a bad attitude may give you some in, in indices that your dog has a problem. The venous blood gas. I said about a quarter of vets have a blood eye scanner or Nova machine. They're inexpensive. They cost a couple thousand dollars. They run all sorts of tests. The thing to make sure since blood gas is not run by vets very often, if you are going to have one done, make sure the machine asks for it. You're paying the bill. It's not disrespectful to say, Doc, is the machine in calibration? And can you be, please make sure the cartridge, because it takes a disposable cartridge, that's good for like 10 or 25 tests. If it's been sitting there since 1992, you really don't want them to use that cartridge. You're, not, you're going to get garbage results. And about half the time I get garbage results from vets still. And I have to go, no, this is nonsense, no, this isn't right. Well, oh yeah, well, we don't do many of them, so I use the cartridge I had, and it expired in 2001. <laughs> just, no, we get another cartridge for 50 bucks, please. Um, anyway, if your vet doesn't have it, veterinary emergency clinics will. These are the five values we look for in venous blood gas. We look for the O2. That tells me that it is a truly venous sample, because that should be in the 40, 50 range, maybe 60. The CO2 which we look at just to get an idea of how hard the dog is working 
to uh, blow down their CO2. But again, we're not, that's not the, the, the key point, as is not the pH anymore. Those used to be critical. Now that is the key. The HCO3, the bicarb level, that's what we look at. And base excess is a number they may or may not calculate for you, but base excess is basically what the name says. It's the amount of excess base. Obviously, if you are a Fanconi dog and losing base or alkaline, you're losing bicarb, which is your buffer or your alkaline, then you have a negative base excess. And the more negative that number is, a mildly affected dog might be a negative two. A highly affected dog that's losing bicarb like a sieve will be a negative 12. So that gives us an idea of how severe the dog's losses are because it's different with every patient. Um, but I put here, the diagnostic test and information is worth traveling for. You've got to get a bicarb test, uh, which is a blood gas. You've got to have a venous blood gas. Um, the new protocol is still based upon the proven basics of re replacing the essential body chemicals, and these are the ones we've talked about. They lose bicarb, they lose protein, and again, if your dog is not in renal insufficiency or renal failure, don't let the vet say, oh, we need to put them on a KD diet, or we need to put them on a low protein diet because it's kidney disease. Well, that be like having a person crawling through the desert on their belly, dehydrating, baking in the sun, and go, you know what? I'm not going to give them this nice cantina of cold water I've had because they've got a water problem. They've got a hydration water problem. Water wasting disease. No. You, in these dogs, if the renal values are normal, they need high protein. They're losing protein. It's the opposite of renal failure where protein isn't broken down completely and you end up with waste products in your blood. And again, some dogs have both problems going on, in which case we balance it out to get the BUN and the and the Fanconi under control. But normally, you want a higher protein diet. Not the insane high protein that you find in some diets, by the way, which now Blue makes some that are like 47, 48% protein, free protein. That will fry your dog's kidneys really well, especially in a Pasenji. You're better off using something with like 28, 29% crude protein. Also, it's on the protocol. Potassium, roughly a third of our dogs need additional potassium on top of the regular protocol vitamins. Phosphorus, that's basically found in meat, which is why dry dog food is fine to use as a meal, but a Fanconi dog has to have some wet meat. I don't care if it's canned Merricks, I don't care if it's wellness, I don't care if you cook them a burger on the grill, just give them, give them some meat at least once a week and, and you're good to go. If you want to give them filet mignon, it's all, you're good. Um, amino acids, we do amino acid supplements and the trace elements, which is why we use the human centrum vitamin because there's certain trace elements that are not even found in the best dog vitamins and mineral mixes. Don't know why, but they're not selenium and manganese thing to them. And good quality dog food and fresh water, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And when I say fresh water, water filter people. Um, your whole families will be better off for it. You, your dogs, especially if they have Fanconi, will be better off for it. There's all kinds of scary things in our water system. Our current water filtration that's done by counties and cities is based upon 1800s technology. It was never meant to deal with the chemotherapy drugs that p patients are taking and losing in the toilet, all the uh, radioactive isotopes that are being lost, all these things are contaminating the water system, and yet a cheap little carbon filter takes on a mass amount of that. So if you have a refrigerator filter, it's fine. If you get a filter pitcher, it's fine. If you put a tap end pure Culligan filter on your, on your faucet, that's fine. But do something other than what the city and county is doing for you. You will, you will be the healthier for it. Um, the entire protocol boils down to putting in the front end what we're losing out the rear end to keep the middle healthy, the, the bucket formula. And in case any of you don't remember, this is what the front end looks like. And this is what the rear end looks like. Period. Point. We can go over that later in case anybody mistakes those two. Um, some additional considerations that are, that are good to know. Um, as I said, the young lady who has been coming, she pops, she runs marathon. She pops a couple bicarb before and a couple after. We have dogs that are lure courses, pop a couple extra bicarb before and a couple extra after if they're doing real hard workout. You know, if you do, there's one Fanconi, uh, actually he's a German Shepherd, and they go out to the park and do Frisbee every day. That dog takes a couple bicarbs, especially afterwards. Afterwards probably being more important to buffer the CO2 load and the lactic acid. Filter water, very important as I talk about. Here's one to note. 
If your dog has anesthesia, a fa controlled faint company dog is normal in every sense of the word. There's no medication we found a problem with. There's no anesthesia we found a problem nothing. Treat them like a normal dog if their faint company is controlled. But their kidneys are very prone to taking a hit. And unlike in human medicine, where we wake the patient up on oxygen routinely and we're measuring their blood, their exhale, their entitled CO2 and whatever, a lot of veterinarians will turn off the gas and throw them in a little cage while they still have the tube in and just let them wake up and as soon as they start rustling and get up, they pull the tube out. Or they'll leave them on the machine or on the table till, and then they pull the tube. It wasn't until I provided my own veterinarian with CO2 and saturation monitoring, you realized, wow, we, that's not good. These dogs are getting very hypoxic, low oxygen in their blood, or very hypercarbic, high CO2 in their blood. Now, if you or I wake up with 10 uh, points less on our, on our uh, uh, intelligence scale, you know, all of a sudden grandpa had his heart work done and now he can't remember ever where he puts the car keys and can't figure out how to put them in the in the uh, lock when he did before, that's a problem. However, if Fifi can't remember where she put her bone or whatever, nobody says a word about it. So it's very difficult to quantify, but you want to protect their brains, but more importantly, in this case, you want to protect the kidneys. So please have your vet wake up the dog on oxygen. In other words, put them in a cage that's oxygenated, put a little oxygen up to their noses, whatever it may be, but you want them, you do not want them to get too high a CO2 or too low an oxygen during wake up. And this is a biggie that I had to re-educate many vets on, but now I've had very little pushback on it. We have in medicine what's called best practice now, and that means you're looking at large groups, you're looking at the scientific evidence, and even if it flies in the face of what you learned before, this is what's been proven most successful. So best practice is the hot word in medicine, in human medicine now. Well, best practice, in human medicine is don't throw an antibiotic at a virus, for instance. For a cold, it used to automatically give you a prescription for antibiotics. Now, it's like pulling teeth, nobody wants to give antibiotics. Well, in this case, if the dog has the behavior of a UTI, urgency, pain, frequent urination, if it acts like a UTI, treat it like that in a Fanconi dog because they can wall off. They have thickened bladders and thickened walls in their kidneys. They will loculate off, that's what it's called, an infection, and they can have an infection literally the size of a pinpoint. And they're having all these problems, but if they do a urinalysis or a culture, they won't find anything because the, the infection is walled off. We you throw antibiotics at it, it immediately clears up because the tissue is very, very vascular. So if it acts like a UTI, treat it as one. And a lot of people now use cranberry capsules, including the humans, um, for helping to treat uh, your chronic urinary tract infections, and they have much results. So a lot of fan company dogs are on cranberry capsules once a day or twice a day, and it, it won't hurt anything, and it may help if that's a problem we've been dealing with. Same as in person. And the phenylpropanolamine, for dogs that just have weak bladder or their bladders are too full, PPM used to be sold, it used to be the diet aid that was sold for humans, but it caused cardiac arrest in some, so it no longer exists for human use. But you can still have the dog put on PPM or prion, that's what it's called. Uh, in veterinary medicine if the dogs are leaking a little bit. Once the fanconi is controlled, you don't want to use this and mask the problem. But once the fanconi is controlled, if you have to, you can use that and help dogs sleep through the night. Um, some other things to look for, elevated liver enzymes. Uh, sadly, I lost our last Basenji, not the one we currently have, but her brother, we lost him to a liver cancer. He had, uh, was a bad seizure dog. And we're gonna talk about seizures in a second which is interesting in a fan company talk, but it's important. But we had, uh, he was on seizure medicine, he was on phenobar. And phenobar is destructive to the liver. And subsequently he developed uh, liver cancer that was found on a routine exam. He looked as healthy as a horse. And we took him in, his liver enzymes were going up, so we took him off the phenobar, put him on a human uh, anti-seizure medicine. He got bright, he got everything looked great, but unfortunately the cancer was already there. It was 80% of his liver was involved by the time we uh, had the diagnosis. And he lived for a year without any symptoms, but we had him on all kinds of medication and we did an experimental treatment by putting certain anti-chemo drug in his, in his or anti-cancer drug in his abdomen. And he was on an experimental protocol for Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, but still, liver failures, liver disease, liver cancer is bad stuff. So um, you don't want to ignore it, but in Fanconi dogs, liver enzymes are often elevated to extremely elevated. 
So I say don't ignore them, but don't panic and say the dog has liver disease because it's happened only a handful of times. If the, the values are really, really high in your Fanconi dog that's treated, they can always do a liver ultra, or a, an ultrasound, not a biopsy, just an ultrasound from the outside and see if there's actually a mass there or if there's a problem there. Because most of the dogs, it just isn't. The liver experts I've talked to think that what's going on is because they're losing protein and amino acids, that it, it changes the osmotic, the, the fluid pressures in the blood, thus pulling certain enzymes out of the liver. And that, that actually kind of makes chemical sense. So don't panic, but expect that you may see these. Thyroid screen done only when the Fanconi is controlled. And this is the big baddie. Uh, any neurological signs, vision, twitching, limping, consider the possibility in a controlled Fanconi dog, you might be dealing with GME, granulomatous meningeal encephalitis, which is a multi-site brain or spinal cord tumor. That's how our first dog, Senji, ended up dying, which right as she was on the cusp of her 13th birthday. Um, we've seen it a fair number of times in Fanconi dogs. Is it associated with Fanconi? I don't know. I, if it were, we'd see a lot more Fanconi dogs with it, and we don't. But we see it a fair amount of time where I know it's a problem and it's talked about in the protocol. And the truth of the matter is, it may just be that we're, we're catching it because we're so attentive to these dogs. Um, and I don't know the incidence of GME in non-Fanconi dogs. So they may have the same normal incidence of it. But it is something to, to watch for. Um, genetic testing. Again, still not 100%, but it's pretty darn close. Uh, if the dog tests positive, get a baseline fetus blood gas right away, begin your monthly urine strip testing. And ideally, about every year, I, if it was my dog, I'd do it every six months, I'd do a venous okay. blood gas. Mm -hmm just to catch the Fanconi at its earliest stage once it's triggered on. Um, if the dog has negative gene testing, you can pretty much relax. Um, you can watch for symptoms, of course. If the dog ever has a problem, then you can do your urine strip testing. But otherwise, if, if the uh, value is clear, you're, you're statistically, you're, you're in the clear with that dog. Um, how close are we physically to our, for, oh, by the way, no throwing of knives, spoons, forks, coffee mugs, or any other objects at me during this next phase, because I'm going to talk about something controversial. My daughter warned me not to, but I have to. How close are we to our fur kids? Pretty close. And these are all the wonderful brand pictures people gave me permission to use. Uh, pretty darn close being the answer. And they are fully a part of our lives. As a matter of fact, that right there is my little princess when we got our, this is the baby boy at the time, this is the one that died of liver cancer, and there's our girl currently that has been coming, that was Topper, and that's Kia. There's our daughter, who of course went home, she felt, it's Kepri. It's Kepri? Oh. Um, <laughs> hey, 35 years of the same, sorry, yeah, yeah. she was right. Um, but anyway, yeah, when they arrived home, she slept on the uh, floor so because they couldn't jump up on the bed at that point. So she was sleeping with them until they could get up on the bed. Um, at all stages of life, we find these dogs are right there with us oh, the water in our face. And uh, in many cases, from the very beginning, one of the first mooches they get are from our four-footed family members. I love this picture up here. That's the puppy pillow. And that's true in my own home. There's my lovely daughter, who is dressed, by the way, as an Egyptian princess today, in honor of our uh, Egyptian dogs here. And there, of course, is Pepper, who you saw earlier in the video. And there is Senji, for whom the protocol was developed, along with a certain somebody who, uh, who uh, was born right as uh, she was finally fixed up on the protocol. It was perfect timing. So she, she grew up in a time where she was so comfortable with the medicine part of this that when our boy dog had a seizure, she was all maybe five years old, and she said, oh, by the way, um, Topper had a seizure last night. Um, I held his head, made sure he didn't lose his airway, and I made sure he went outside to pee after he was done, and then I made sure he got to bed. I didn't think it was worth waking you guys up for. So there you go. Um, but anyway, maintaining good health. Obviously with them in our faces like that, maintaining good health is 
critical. Fake county dogs have compromised immune systems. We want to maintain extra care. Um, we want to stay current on all vaccinations, immunizations, heartworm, flea and tick protection. Remember I said these are normal dogs in every sense of the word, other than being the They're normal dogs in every sense of the word um, when it comes to their medical care. Um, you want to do their routine teeth cleaning, all the rest of us, just keep the oxygen levels good. Uh, avoid dangerous toys and treats. We already know what those are about. Pay attention to where they're made. Pay very close attention because, as someone pointed out, they'll put USA, but it was sent to a USA company from certain other countries. Um, filtered water and a good quality diet. And this is the controversial part. Okay, slings and arrows. Bones and raw food. And I have to put this in here because I get this question now, maybe even once a week. And it never used to come up till a few years ago. Um, barf dives. This is something controversial. I'm sorry, it really is. And I know there's advocates that say it's the best thing ever and the dogs have never looked better and they have great coats and their poops are smaller and it's just the best thing ever. And there is an increasing medical review of the diets and I will be the first to admit there appears to be some benefits to it based upon what some people say and there are some dangers. However, I would point out to you that dog guts have evolved as ours have. We don't eat raw meat or whatever, we're no, clo you know, we're no closer to Cro-Magnum than our, our wolves or our dogs are to the wolves or their earliest counterpart. I know humans are now all into this paleo diet um, and we're kind of doing the same to our dogs with the barf diet. And, but, I, woo, 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 back. the fact of the matter is dogs do have shorter uh, intestinal tract, they have more acidic environment, they can tolerate many of these pathogens that are found in these diets. And I will point out this, I just read the latest study, which was produced within the last month, that says in 80% of the raw diets tested, 80% of commercial raw diets did contain pathogens. That was including those designed, wholesome, fresh, whatever. Um, the, the, the critters that are at risk may not be the dog though, it may be us. Um, there are incidents of flesh-eating bacteria, severe intestinal disorder, death uh, associated with humans that were feeding raw food diets to their pets. Um, and I would contend, in reality, just as our ancestors living in caves didn't have a real long life expectancy, wild dogs, wolves, wild dogs, they have, they're disease riddled and they don't live very long lives and they're very brutal lives. So the idea of raw kind of doesn't make a lot of sense to me, sorry. Um, and the truth is when you get raw meat from a butcher, it's not a fresh killed gazelle on the Serengeti plain. It just isn't. Uh, you, if you saw a slaughterhouse and then saw how meat is dressed and packed, it wouldn't be real attractive to you. Now, having said all that, and because this is going to Japan real soon, in Japan and France, there are human consumable raw meats for sale steak tartare and a bunch of other things and they are actually in highly controlled plants that are literally sterilized. The meat is butchered, packed, and shipped within 48 hours. All that bears a label of the animal it came from. Not just the packing plant or the, I mean it's incredibly closely tracked which is why they have almost zero incidence of, of pathogens. And in those countries you want to feed raw, if you think for some reason it has a benefit that's fine. In the States, I'd be far, far more cautious. Um, and I'd be far more cautious not just for the humans, but because these dogs have a compromised immune system. So even if three of your other nine Fanconi dogs do well on it, it may pose a risk to the Fanconi dog. And I'll be blunt, I looked, in all due respect to my daughter that warned me not to tread this ground and, and have anybody into raw diets, because people take it like a religion, they're, they're very defensive of it, but I could not find one single research article from a major university or from a veterinary medical association, not one, that actually supported it. Just fact, if you've got some, I would love to have it in my files. This is from the ASPCA, uh, from science-based medicine, Rummy, I mean, yeah. Canadian Veterinary Medical Association, I just pulled review after review and none of them were really uh, in favor of, of, of feeding raw. However, I will, and because we want our dog to look like this, not like this, a feeding time, um, these, these sites, again, these are all on the protocol, so you can, you can, you can click them. 
This is my favorite dog food site, but this one will actually give you recalls and warnings or whatever. But you go there and you can learn a lot about how to, how to do the best nutritionally for your, for your pets. All right, seizures and dogs. Why in the world am I going to talk about seizures and dogs other than the fact that I had seizures in my dogs? Some people, it's out on the grapevine, know it, and so I get calls about that as well. But if you look at what can cause seizures, eating poison, liver disease, ooh, we'll tell with that, high and low blood sugar, but kidney disease and electrolyte problems. There you go. Fanconi dogs are more prone to seizures until their Fanconi is completely controlled. Um, and of course, you've got the other the other potassium, uh, oh, boom. let's try this again, head injuries, encephalitis, strokes, brain cancer, all sorts of things can cause seizures, even just heat stroke. We have dogs that are active, they're outside, they love the heat, they get a little dehydrated, especially if they a dog, can get dehydrated, boom, you got a seizure. So one seizure, it's worth having the vet check it out, but if it comes and it's gone, don't lose a whole lot of sleep over it. But the most common treatment for seizures is phenobarbital. It's inexpensive, it's historically proven, it's decent for seizures, but I'll tell you, it's sedating. And I didn't realize how sedating until my own dog came off it after sadly it had done its liver damage, and we put him on the human medicine, so it was onisamide, and all of a sudden he was like a puppy again. He was bright, he was active, he was right there. So I'm, I am not a big fan of, of Phenobarb. Um, potassium bromide is often prescribed in young dogs. Um, it's not damaging the kidney, but it's less effective for seizures way too many other good options. Starting with B6, not a B-complex vitamin, mind you, but straight B6, which you can buy over the counter at any drugstore. Um, this is even being used in human uh, neurology at this point. I, my specialty is I deal with uh, ortho and neurotrauma uh, and trauma spine. That's, that's what I do every day. And so I deal with a lot of head injury patients. I can tell you patients that have seizures, B6 has made a world of difference. So now you've got neurologists all over the place recommending it. What it does is increases the uh, chemical in your brain that helps uh, promote um, awareness and it increases the seizure threshold, which means your body has to do go a lot further into a bad place to have a seizure. So it stabilizes seizure activity. You've got zonisamide. Um, which we used on our dog, which is a human anti-seizure medicine. It's not particularly expensive. It doesn't destroy uh, the kidneys and it's, or the liver, and it is not sedating. So if I had a seizure dog, I'd be doing those two things right off the bat. One of the surgeons I have has a non basenji who was having about four grand mal seizures a day and a couple petite mal where they just might stare or they don't go into the generalized shakes. He's gotten his dog on this, and he has not had a seizure since. So. Good, good stuff. Um, if you have normal cats, by the way, the sonosamide is not as effective in cats. Um, but there are many more new anti-seizure options, so I would always consult a, a veterinary neurologist. These are three of the, uh, or two of the brand new drugs, and then there's gabapentin, where you can give GABA right away that augments the, the, um, the blood levels. This is good for pets not responding to other medicines because they go right to the to the source in the brain where seizures usually start. Um, but these two, uh, Keppra and, and Thalbatamine, is seem to be uh, very successful in some veterinary practices. <laughs> pill hiding, ooh, we ain't <laughs> dealing with Fanconi, has to know about <laughs> pill hiding. Um, before I go with, anywhere with this, I'm gonna tell you, our dog for the last several years took all, all her pills in Velveeta cheese. We make a little ball in the Velveeta slice, she take it. Then she started refusing it, and then she totally wouldn't touch it. We switched to craft slices. Apparently, Velveeta did something with their formula, because she didn't want to know from it anymore, but she did take the craft slices. Then after a while, it was like, no, this isn't working for me. So I was going to use pill pockets, except for the fact pill pockets are not an option. They block bicarbonate. And I've had dogs taking pill pockets with bicarb and their blood gases were horrible and we couldn't figure it out. I said, how are you giving it to the dog? Okay, let's get rid of the pill packet, boom. All of a sudden the bicarb level went skyrocketing up. So you don't want to not just use it to hide your bicarb, but you can't give it at the same time you're giving your other pills. Because, or the, the, if you wrap your other pills in a pill packet and give it along with the bicarb, it'll block the bicarb anyway. So pill packets, they're great for some things, not for treating a Fanconi dog. But this, 
formula works awesome. One tablespoon of flour, tablespoon of milk, tablespoon of creamy peanut butter. You mix it up and then you knead it like Play-Doh, put it in the fridge in a little plastic container. You just wrap the pills in it and it goes down slick as can be. I mix that formula up in a dose of five. Five, uh, oh, I made a mistake. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> that should be two tablespoons. That's two tablespoons of all-purpose flour. I need to correct that and make sure it's correct on the protocol card, which we will do. But two tablespoons of flour, a tablespoon of milk, and a tablespoon of creamy peanut butter. And actually, if I mix 10 flour, five milk, and five creamy peanut butter, I'll add a little extra peanut butter, like an extra teaspoon. It gives it a better consistency, and it's really nice to wrap. And it stays in the fridge, and the dog loves it. You can also use it as treats. So they get used to taking it and just swallowing it. And of course, if you have more than one dog, oh, yeah. I don't think I'm teaching anything, but that's your best weapon. Just give them something at the same time, just make sure the dog with the pain pony is getting the, the one with yeah. pills in it. But competition, man, they don't examine it too close. Another dog can take it from them. They just go, and that's the end of it. Um, in the best case scenario, supplements are available everywhere and pretty inexpensive. I'll be honest with you, I don't endorse any specific thing, but in this case, I think it's significant enough. Two things, number one, I buy my stuff all on Amazon. In Amazon, actually, if you go to buy bicarb, you'll see the vitamins and amino acid down at the side because so many people buy it for Fancomi dogs that it is, it is now skewed the way their advertising comes up. But it's very inexpensive. A bottle of 1,000 bicarb should cost between $17 and $25. If somebody wants to charge you more than that, go away. Um, <laughs> but I get all this stuff on Amazon. You can get a local pharmacy, whatever the case may be. Um, this is Pet Tabs CF. They, they keep changing the formula so the protocol card gets wrong. CF is calcium formula. That, we give that not just for the calcium, but because it's the best source, source of phosphorus there is. Um, and then this is Pet Tabs. This used to be Pet Tabs Plus. Now it's called Pet Tabs AF or Pet Tabs Plus AF, which stands for advanced formula as opposed to uh, calcium formula. And I'm sure they'll change the name in another week or two as well. Amino you know, acids, I replace long chain amino acids, which are broken down and cooked out of almost any food, no matter how good a quality it is, which is why they need, most dogs, most humans' bodies can reconstitute the long chains from the short chain bits. A Fanconi dog is peeing it away too quick, so we need the long chain amino acids. So actually giving the amino acid supplement um, is the way to go. And, um, uh, Bicarb, when it comes to Bicarb, I love this particular brand. There's three brands that are very, very good, URL, Lily, and Rugby. Rugby seems to get to a blood level highest, quickest in dog's gut. So while I don't particularly endorse one brand over another, we've seen some other brands where the Bicarb pill came out the rear end the same way it went in the front end. They don't dissolve it all in the dog. So at this point, until I see different rugby URL or Lily, but I really love rugby. It's available at Walmart pharmacies, CVS carries at Walgreens. Just ask the pharmacist or on Amazon. Again, I buy all my stuff on Amazon. It's cheap, it gets delivered quick, and I'm good to go. But rugby seems to do the best job in our dog. Question. Steve, real, yes. real quick. The pet tabs, do they have one or the other or both? Well, that, that's a good question. No, actually, the Pet Tabs uh, is Pet Tab Plus or Pet Tabs Plus AF is the multivitamin that's given twice a day in a Fanconi dog. The Pet Tabs CF is a different thing. It's also given twice a day to a Fanconi dog, but this is actually the calcium formula designed for lactating females. And in Fanconi dogs, it replaces the calcium and the phosphorus level that they're losing. So yeah, they want to be taking both of these every day. They're two separate, completely separate things. Doctor, can you crush the pills? You can crush everything except by them. You, you can, they even sell like amino fuel, they sell it in a powder formula. They sell, they sell vitamins, they sell granules of the, the these. You don't have to be these brands. There's other calcium, phosphorus formulas for lactating dogs. There's other dog vitamins. I don't care what brand you use, really. It's, I, these are nationally, internationally available, so that's why I mention them. But I, any brand, as long as it's a complete canine vitamin and a complete calcium formula, for, and, and they sell them in granules, you can pour on the food, you can crush them up and make them into a powder. Just don't adulterate their water. Don't adulterate their water, because you don't want them to stop drinking. 
So you can mix it though with food or food treat, however you can get it in the dog, totally doesn't matter. The only thing you do not want to crush is bicarb. And you don't want to put bicarb like into their dinner bowl. First of all, it's bitter, mm -hmm. and they might not eat. Second of all, and more importantly, it will buffer the food and have no biological activity by the time it's in the dog. So that really does need to be given intact. In the case where you have a dog that really won't take them intact, you can coarsely crush them and put them into a capsule. And dogs tend to take capsules easier than they do pills. And as a matter of fact, there was a period of time about a year ago, maybe two years ago, where Bicarb, all of a sudden there was a disaster with a factory or distributor. I don't know what the deal was. Nobody could get it. You couldn't buy Bicarb. And it's really just baking soda. So I told people to go out and buy baking soda. And for 30 bucks off of eBay or even less or on Amazon now, you can get these little pill capsule making, capsule filling machines, empty gel caps, and they have the little crusher and you just literally fill your own, make your own uh, bicarb capsules. So worst case scenario, you can always make and fill your own. Um, share the love. The protocol, which I'm about to share with you, is freely. I never charge for my work. Veterinarians can contact me anytime. Email is best. Uh, I check that a couple times a day. Um, I am here to share this in any language, any form, any, any assistance I can lend to the vets. I cannot, though, legally give medical information to an owner. I can't say, give this, this, and this. The, that, that has to go from me to the vet as a resource, and then the vet can treat the dog appropriately. Um, just so you know, you probably already do. I've never accepted a penny for my assistance, and nor have any funding for research. This has all been a labor of love, just sharing what saved my own dog. Um, you can share the protocol in any way you can, as long as it's complete and accurate. You can copy and print it, put it on your own website, do whatever you want with it, link to it. And uh, the protocol is now available worldwide. It's really funny. I think the last time I looked, it was in 14 different languages. It's in Ukrainian and German and Russian, Japanese, um, you name it. It's in all kinds of all kinds of languages. I mean, there's actually a acrylic version in Russian, which is really kind of kind of funny to look at. And so it gives me great pleasure to present the all new 2015 Fantoni Management Protocol for Veterinarians. And I've got a box of 100 copies here. So please help yourself, take it to your vet, share it, make sure all your vets are specially vetted if you go to one for a blood gas, has it and uses it. And I thank you again so much for having me here.